Sticks of Freedom rise over Prague, capital of Czechoslovakia, one of the first free nations ruthlessly taken over by the Nazis. In these pictures of Prague's liberation, just released, German signs are torn down and smashed. But Prague's long fight is not yet won. The Germans still hold armed control. And though the Third Reich has officially surrendered, and most of the world is already celebrating, SS troops in Prague continue senseless resistance, setting up gun positions in the streets. Two days after surrender by the German high command, the people of Prague emerge in full revolt against the German garrison. Prague's streets become a battleground. The Czechs battle for their own liberation and that of the last great city still in German hands. Germans turn artillery on the city. In the bitter six-day fight, over 2,000 are killed. But Prague is liberated. German rule is wiped out. Troops of the Red Army enter the city. With them are units of the 1st Czechoslovak Army, which fought all the way from the Volga. Benesh, president of Czechoslovakia, returns to his native land. The people of Prague welcome the distinguished statesman who has long fought for his nation's freedom. After seven years of tyranny, Czechoslovakia is once again its own master. A herd of specially selected American cattle awaits shipment across the Atlantic by the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration to be used in the rebuilding of Europe's war-depleted livestock. Up ramps to board the ship go the cattle. Through scientific breeding, these animals will help replenish herds which war and German pillaging have decimated. This shipload is bound for Greece, but other hard-pressed nations are also to be aided by UNRWA in the task of rebuilding their supply of dairy herds and draft animals so that they will be able to feed themselves. James F. Burns is sworn in as United States Secretary of State before President Truman and members of Congress and the Cabinet. Close advisor to Franklin D. Roosevelt, Mr. Burns brings a wealth of administrative experience to his new high position. Former Secretary Edward Stettinius, now appointed United States Representative to the United Nations, congratulates Secretary of State Burns. Mr. Cordell Hull, long President Roosevelt's Secretary of State, signs the new World Security Charter adopted at San Francisco. Mr. Hall had served from his Washington hospital bed as a member of the United States delegation. A lifelong advocate of international cooperation, Mr. Hall worked tirelessly to help pave the way for this momentous agreement. Avenue de la Grande Armée, 50,000 strong, come French and French colonial troops in Paris' greatest parade since liberation. Five years ago, in his first broadcast to fallen France, General de Gaulle made his celebrated statement that France had lost a battle, but not the war. The 
day through the triumphal arch and on down the Champs-Élysées, the French people celebrate the fulfillment of final victory. At the obelisk, the column divides to march into the Place de la Concorde. On the reviewing platform, in the shadow of the tricolor, General de Gaulle salutes the men who fought through five bitter years of brilliant and heroic battle for France. of his home, Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek holds an informal conference with Lieutenant General Albert Wiedemeyer, commander of United States forces in China. General Wiedemeyer talks in Chinese with the Generalissimo. As Chiang's chief of staff, Wiedemeyer has played an important role in reorganizing United States trained and equipped armies of China, which are now on the advance against the Japanese. on in the Philippines as throughout the Pacific, a mighty dragnet tightens on the enemy. Except for a few last holdouts, the Japanese have now been driven completely from the Philippines. Those who still resist are destroyed, adding to the 450,000 Japanese killed in these islands. on Okinawa, now secure in American control, fanatical resistance comes to an end. Over a loudspeaker, a Japanese prisoner urges his comrades to surrender. Then, through their glasses, American troops watch as the Army's carefully planned psychological warfare program begins to take mass effect. The enemy has learned that the United States abides fully by the Geneva Convention, and many Japanese want to stay alive. On a cliff, another loudspeaker carries the words of a young Okinawan to the concealed enemy. Waving an American surrender leaflet, a Japanese officer gives up. His men surrendered or dead, himself wounded, he takes the intelligent course and surrenders. From every corner of the island, the Japanese prisoners come in, giving up because they know that they and their warlords have only defeat ahead. But at the prisoner of war camp, there will be food and medical care and an end to the useless fighting. In spite of fanatic officers, in spite of false Bushido propaganda, 9,000 Japanese have surrendered on Okinawa. The Pacific dragnet tightens. Death or surrender is the only choice for Japan. Yeah.